this will be fairly quick because I do want to have time to discuss. And essentially, uh, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about the opening of the Pisan Cantos and the place those cantos and that canto in particular to play in the story that the American Academy at least tells itself about difficulty in poetry. And so it actually should work nicely with Ben's stuff. And then Doug is going to prove that poetry isn't hard after all, which I'm looking forward to. So that's really lovely. Um, well, actually, what I chose to do today was not to do, uh, say, Frost Directive or the fascination of, of what's difficult by Yeats or some lovely short lyric poem that I could sort of perform the alchemy of of teaching or try to at least and say, look, it, it looks difficult, but it's actually lovely and beautiful and not difficult and ta-da. Um, what I chose instead was a much more disturbing and I hope more interesting text, which is a poem whose vexed history and vexed compositional history and vexed material on the page itself is such that I still don't know how I feel about it and um, don't know what I think about its difficulty. So I thought that would lead potentially at least to something more interesting. What I think I'll do is just read what's on your page below the toilet paper scrap, uh, you'll see the text of this opening of, of the 74th canto. Um, yeah, I'll just read it. The enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasant's bent shoulders, manes, manes was tanned and stuffed. Thus, Ben and La Clara a Milano, by the heels at Milano, that maggots should eat the dead bullock. Digonos, digonos, but the twice crucified. Where in history will you find it? Yet say this to the possum, a bang, not a whimper, with a bang, not with a whimper. To build the city of Diosse, whose terraces are the color of stars, the suave eyes, quiet, not scornful. Rain also is of the process. What you depart from is not the way. And olive tree blown white in the wind, washed in the Kang and Han, what whiteness will you add to this whiteness? What candor? Okay, just, just a couple of, of notes about that. That's just the opening of a long section of, of the poem. So um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that go on here. There's some uh, footnotes, which is part of the story of modernism itself, of course, starting with, I guess, the wasteland in some way or another, that is poems that have their own accompanying glosses to the difficulty of that, that poem. Um, doubling and repetition everywhere, that is two deaths, two killings. Uh, the principle in Pound's own composition of the cantos of historical rhyme, that is finding one event that's like another event that's like another event, now gone sort of amok or awry in some way or another, so that uh, he's trying to incorporate this double killing of, of um, Benito Mussolini and, and Clara Patacci, his, his Mussolini's lover, uh, by being shot and then the next day hung. And the sense of where else in history will you find it in Pound's urgent sense that in fact, of course we know you find it all over history, but Pound needs to find a rhyme for that to make it cohere or make sense in some way or another. So there's an enormous amount of weight on the word thus, thus Ben and La Clara. Um, and then how much weight to on this yet? Um, Pound's response to T.S. Eliot, the end of the hollow men, yet say this to the possum, the intimacy of nickname and memory triggering for Pound. One of the things that happens in this poem is this sort of gigantic accumulation of pieces that flood into his mind, memories that he's talking to as well as things he's talking to in the present moment. Um, also the temperamental habit of Pound's on insistence. So this poem repeats and shouts partly because, at its beginning especially, because that's how Pound is. This is Pound for about whom Gertrude Stein famously said, some of you have heard this before, forgive me, um, that Ezra Pound was a village explainer, which was excellent if you were a village, but if not, not. Um, so this is somebody who can't not say things twice one way or another. There's also the sense structurally here of psychological uh, brokenness, that is, voices that break into a person's head, again, this phrase, my own students have heard this before, but Wyndham Lewis famously and cru cruelly calls Pound not a person, but a little crowd of people. So filled is he with voices. So the sense of voices breaking in in this text itself. So um, the break here, to build the city of Diose, Confucius, uh, this terrible twisting of the Confucian line, Confucian about equanimity, structure, power, order, clarity, and peace in some way or another. Pound, when he's arrested, uh, in Pisa has a copy of Confucius he's translating that he takes with him. And so there's this incredible tension here between Pound 
the historian, the fascist, the activist, and pound the Confucian philosopher, and the two things don't fit, and so you see those things tearing this poem apart in one way or another. The idea of the purity of the way, a uh, huge question throughout the piece in Canada, is it becomes a legal question as well when Pound is, is going to be put on trial. Is he speaking to himself here? Um, this this um, what you depart from is not the way that is, is this a story about a sort of recantation and a realization that, oh, it turns out my embrace of Mussolini's regime of an Italian fascism was a mistake, or is what you, is that you designating the U.S. Army, uh, is it designating uh, all of those who conspired to kill Mussolini, the leader, it's, and, and it's unresolved in all kinds of ways. The poem itself stands at a really important point in American academic history about difficulty and aesthetics and its relation to politics. So this poem is published um, in July of 1948, and seven months later, the Library of Congress, for the first and last time, gives it uh, the Bowling Award for Poetry, $10,000 award. Um, there was so much uproar following their giving this poem, that award, that they said, why don't we just let Yale take over giving the prize out? So that's, they're done with that. But, um, but essentially, I just wanted to, uh, the New York Times headline, which you have at the very end of your three-page sheet here, just puts it wonderfully, a great headline day for that, that writer. Um, Pound in mental clinic wins prize for poetry penned in treason cell. <laughs> it's like the, it's a this great poem, person could just you know go home at the end of that day. It's, it's, you did a good job on the headline there. Um, this is from the Bulligan Prize Committee's text as they're awarding the prize, and it's worth reading. I think just this little bit of it. Um, there's a whole book collecting responses to the uh, prize and the uproar around the cantos. The fellows are aware, that is the Bullingham Prize fellows, <laughs> the fellows are aware that objections may be made to awarding a prize to a man situated as is Mr. Pound. <laughs> and it's lovely that there's two, two uh, branches of the American government. One's put him in jail, the other's given him $10,000. It's like, mm, trying to figure this out. To permit other considerations than that of poetic achievement, to sway the decision would destroy the significance of the award and would in principle deny the validity of that objective perception of value on which civilized society must rest. So in this way, it's the apotheosis of new criticism's insistence that poetry is not about social engagement, is not, is, that art is immune from certain kinds of moral judgment in some way, that this is a beautiful thing and should be awarded that because it's beautiful. And its difficulty then becomes a kind of sign of its aesthetic qualities that deserve praise. Um, if you're not taken by the poetry or you're objecting to this, then it becomes the apotheosis of Benjamin's uh, fascism is sort of watching, uh, watching the aestheticization of politics is this poem precisely. Phase two of the reading of this poem and a kind of attempt to redeem Pound in some ways is that its difficulty, that is its brokenness, is the sign of a man who, sort of a later King Lear on the Heath, Renaissance reference here, I like Doug. That, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> that essentially this is someone who is so broken by his experience that the incoherence or the disjunctness of this canto and of these cantos is itself a sign of the difficulty of a man coming to terms with his world as it has fallen apart appropriately. Thank goodness it's difficult here because it's a sign that Pound is having some kind of moral turn. There are many different gorgeous phrases in the cantos everywhere here that are used in that in the service of that. So, uh, for example, famously, pull down thy vanity, it is not man made courage or made order or made grace. Pull down thy vanity, I say, pull down, learn of the green world, what can be thy place in scaled invention or true artistry. Um, I think that's great, as long as the thy isn't directed to the U.S. Army. <laughs> so if it's Pound talking to himself, we're very happy and the difficulty's redeemed. If it's Pound saying to the Army, back off, has a whole different take on it there. Phase three comes in 1985 with a wonderful work of Ron Bush, who's a critic and, a, and immersed himself in the difficulties of the compositional history of, this can of these cantos, and discovered that, in fact, it is not all written in one fell swoop by Pound, both in the cages at Pisa where he was held for um, 60 days, some a month or so, three weeks, and then the tent where he was moved from when he was suffering more from breakdown, but in fact had been composed over a long period of time, a couple of years, and over three different phases. And what we have just read, this, this initial section that I just read out loud, that is actually added later to the cantos. So actually the the break here where um, it's, it's a comma break, it's just astonishing in a way, 
with a bang, not with a whimper, comma, to build the city of Diose. That was the first line of the canto as it originally existed. Pound in a mood when he's feeling particularly angry and also at least potentially less on the line for possibly being executed adds an angry defensive Mussolini at the beginning of the cantos. So part of the difficulty here uh, is knowing the textual history of this canto as it evolves and seeing the ways in which it is at odds with itself. It is as um, incoherence the wrong word, but as vexed in its compositional history over time as Pound's own response to the agonies he's in, the agonies Italy's in, the agonies the world's in, um, there's a way in which the evidence of the text itself as it unfolds becomes more, not less difficult, and the textual history of the poem reveals that whatever else we say about its references, however many footnotes we check out, we're also finding a poem that is um, in process, as all the cantos in some ways are in process, um, over the course of its life, and its own processual history gives us a new way of reading uh, sort of how difficult he might work or what it might mean for this poem. And in that way, I feel like what I return to when I come back to these poems is, is looking at sort of this dark, terrifying part of American and, and European and, and world history in the middle of the 20th century and thinking, uh, here's the nexus of power, of claims for order, of disorder at the heart of those claims as well. And the difficulty suddenly has more consequence to me than it did in any... Um, in any number of poems that I could resolve more easily. So should this poem get an award? I don't know. I love it that the award's history is part of its own material now. Um, the sense that the stakes are high for the poem, for the occasion of how we'd honor the poem, that's what matters to me about this. So that's, that's, that's enough for me for now.